coordinates. All right, Just, uh, I would like to welcome all our uh, participants. And of course, uh, I would like to welcome you, uh, our speakers, and I would like to thank you uh, for accepting my invitation. Uh, all five of you, you have a different angle and we will look differently today on the same subject. The subject of today is uh, the world, which is now, which we have now, and this uh, post-COVID investment strategies and opportunities. And we decided to start uh, this conversation with a general overview and how the world is uh, after this COVID-19 and so how is the changing economy and who are the winners versus uh, the losers. So what is the program of our event? First, we will have five speeches and uh, our speakers know that I kindly ask them to have the speech within seven minutes. So it will take us 35 minutes altogether. I have a nice timer here, maybe a little bit outdated, but uh, it's tea timer. So when I do like this, five minutes, I will know that five minutes passed, we have seven minutes each. Uh, and uh, speakers know uh, who will have speeches after who. And then we'll have an important part of our today's meeting is panel discussion. So I would like to share uh, opinions uh, to comment the other speeches and I urge our attendees uh, to type their questions uh, to the chat so during panel discussion we can also answer their questions. So without further delay I would like to thank our sponsors uh, Sberbank Private Banking, ATG Fund Services, Astrobank, PwC Cyprus for supporting this event for making it happening and uh, I would like to give the floor uh, and uh, the possibility to talk first uh, to uh, our first uh, speaker and panelist, Mr. Marius Dimitriadis. He's the manager partner of MD Mindset Capital and uh, former Minister of Communication and Works. And today we have the subject, the general subject uh, regarding the COVID. Mr. Dimitriadis, the floor is yours. Okay, good morning, everybody. So um, I only have seven minutes, so we'll, I tend to keep my time. So I'm just going to share basically some slides with you. So starting from the beginning, um, I would like to cover in uh, today's uh, presentation three areas. Basically, who are the winners and who are the losers from this crisis? Because in every crisis, of course, there are always winners and losers whether COVID-19 has signaled a further blow towards globalization, and what are the possible long-term impacts uh, on economies? And I would say a couple of things on Cyprus as well. So going to the winners and the losers. So if you think about it, everybody understands that basically um, what has happened has uh, uh, promoted the use of online services. So we see companies operating the entertainment sector like Netflix and Disney Plus and all these other companies registering uh, millions of new users because people have stopped going to cinemas and of course they do prefer to stay at home and uh, have their entertainment there. We also see a lot of um, promotion of education uh, uh, apps like Zoom, the one that we're currently using. So we see companies uh, that used to have like a small capitalization suddenly the capitalization increasing tenfold. And of course, this will probably be the big winners uh, for the future as well. Um, I was actually in a discussion uh, about startups about a month ago, and there was uh, one of these uh, people, one of these venture capital, one of these startup uh, companies that basically has uh, software for online teaching. It was saying that after COVID-19, their clients have increased a um, hundred times. Uh, other companies like DocuSign, Five9, all these companies they have to do with uh, basically enabling people working from home. So these companies have benefited from work uh, as well. So um, also the, the sector of e-commerce, of course, uh, companies like Amazon have benefited a lot as people have started or um, have accelerated using technology or online sites to buy things. And generally speaking, of course, the healthcare sector uh, we do understand that uh, not only companies that are investigating uh, uh, vaccines for uh, COVID-19, but also generally speaking, people and I think countries have decided to spend more on, on healthcare. So we see what is happening in the European Union where people 
uh, countries can uh, uh, get money from the ESM, can borrow money from the ESM for healthcare spending. So healthcare spending will definitely increase more in the future. Now, in the loser side, of course, generally speaking, the logistics side, uh, they are definitely a loser and the outsource. And starting with the airlines, everybody understands what has uh, happened to the airlines. Only in Europe, they are expected to lose about uh, 15.4 billion because of the pandemic. A lot of companies will go uh, down. Um, this uh, basically comes after a long period where airlines benefited from the growth. I think it will take some years for the, the, the traffic to go where it used to be before. Um, the shipping sector has always uh, has also, of course, uh, suffered. The WTO estimates that there will be an increase, a decrease in uh, world trade between 13 and 32 percent. So apart from tankers that benefited from storing uh, oil because of the crisis in the oil prices, all the rest uh, are suffering this year. And uh, of course, it will take some time for them to recover. Now, another two sectors that would definitely suffer, the, the sector of real estate, not only short term, but also long term. Uh, if we think about it, the office space, the need for office space will decrease. I mean, like companies like Facebook have announced that within the next five years, uh, the 50% of their employees will work from home. Uh, there will be more companies like this. So generally speaking, there will be less need for office space. Also, shopping malls. So there will be less uh, need for brick and mortar. And finally, consumer discretionary, because of the uh, recession, people will decrease their spending. Now, moving fast to the um, issue of globalization, Mr. Modi, who's a big uh, defender of globalization, he said at Davos that basically globalization is slowly losing its luster and that protectionism is gaining ground. And that was a question uh, posed by economists as well. Uh, globalization is already suffering from the uh, Sino-American trade war. Okay, the tariffs uh, have decreased from what they used to be, but they are still five times of uh, what they were before Mr. Trump was elected. So now with COVID-19, we see that uh, countries are becoming more um, uh, protectionist for their national champions. Actually, they're putting money into their national champions. So expect that they will promote more the use of national champions. Also countries, they are starting to divert their reliance from a single country. And, and of course, this is expected to affect negatively more China. So we will see people having a number of supply uh, countries and not relying on one country. Uh, and of course, the other thing, there will be more bans on traveling. So we see um, that uh, there will be category A countries, category B, we see this thing happening already in Cyprus. Of course, the impact is not likely to be clear until the end of 2020. Now, moving to uh, the third area, just to say something very brief about Cyprus. Cyprus will be affected more than other countries because of, of our heavy reliance on tourists. And of course, the banking sector, which is still very large in Cyprus compared to the size of the economy, will be affected even more because uh, we haven't uh, solved the problem of NPLs yet. And I mean, you know, let's uh, accept that there will be an increase in NPLs from this crisis. And of course, we have a banker today who will do a speech about it. So, so he's more of an expert than me. Now, moving uh, forward, uh, generally we have to, and everybody realize that we are witnessing a, a so-called technology leap. Technology leap doesn't mean that everybody will be using uh, uh, only digital services from now on, but it means that uh, instead of a growth of let's say three or four percent or five percent of people using technology, there will be a growth of 10%. So this is called a technology leap. So uh, more people will be using uh, technology as a result of COVID-19, irrespective of whether we find a vaccine in the next, I don't know, 10, 12 months. Uh, also, the healthcare sector will benefit as people realize that we, can, we cannot ignore isolated pandemics. I mean, don't forget that like uh, this COVID-19 uh, and the coronavirus is not something new, but people were saying it's isolated, it's only in Asia, and they were not uh, giving the right attention. There will be ne less need for brick and mortar. And of course, people will need to invest more in what is needed for digitization, like telecom infrastructure. So despite of what they say about 5G, expect that there will be an accelerated use of 5G. Finally, we will see a, a shifting of supply chain. We will not see a decrease of uh, world trade uh, long term, 
but the supply chain will change as people will, as I said before, uh, rely more uh, on, on an increasing number of countries instead of only one country. So I have included a couple of slides about Cyprus. I do believe in general that Cyprus needs to decrease its reliance on tourists, and this time in a more, uh, uh, in a more organized way uh, than before. I do believe that Cyprus will benefit from the increased use of head office because people will uh, be able to work more um, and it would be acceptable for people to work from home <coughs> or from remote locations. And of course, this will decrease the disadvantage that Cyprus has uh, with the less um, connectivity. Uh, connectivity, of course, this will get even worse now. So Cyprus will benefit, provided we take the right steps in increasing this uh, connectivity. So generally speaking, as a conclusion, I would say that this crisis will be probably worse than originally predicted. Technology leap uh, benefits can be significant for countries that adopt new technologies and countries will try and benefit from new trends. So instead of arguing about things about uh, how we're gonna give uh, state guarantees about banks, uh, I will let George expand on that. We should try and benefit from this, although I do believe that state guarantees is definitely something that should take place. Uh, and I do believe in general about Cyprus that we are entering the crisis in a relatively good position. But if we are not careful about our economics, I think this can easily be reversed. And also uh, we need to focus now on how we can benefit from this crisis and stop uh, uh, you know, just handing out uh, checks to people like we did before and was a failed strategy. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marius, for this introduction and this general presentation. And uh, I ask our next speaker, Mr. Golosov, uh, to, uh, so I will make sure that everything is fine and unmuted. So Mr. Golosov to continue, and uh, he will speak about cri current crisis uh, versus history and the recovery shape and behavioral changes, challenging going forward, and uh, also identifying the dark horses. So I would like to introduce to you our next speaker, Mr. Dmitry Golosov, the head of investment advice in CIB Cyprus Limited. Dmitry, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I, I would like to outline uh, certain, um, certain peculiarities which current crisis have, uh, because basically first time ever, um, in the history of economic observation, uh, when the crisis hits simultaneously on uh, supply and demand side, first of all, uh, usually macroeconomists um, use the method of finding similar trends in the past and then you know, trying to conclude that in the future we may have a similar outcome. In the current situation, uh, it's impossible to do because all the crises for at least the 20th century um, were driven by a different reason. Um, Therefore, uh, it's important to outline the most important feature of the crisis, and that would also affect our discussion about the recovery and about the losing and winning sector, is uh, lightning fast increase of the world's debt uh, because of the current crisis. Here is very important to mention that uh, the fact itself of the debt, as we've seen on the example of Japan and America as well, is not uh, something really bad or good by itself. Uh, the point is, though, that uh, uh, the ratio of uh, credit growth, the ability of countries to produce more debt, is directly impacting the ratio of economic growth. Therefore, if currently we kind of push the pedal to maximum, that will definitely limit our uh, ability to grow the economy further worldwide. Um, a part of that, a part of the debt, uh, the important thing is um, to, to, to notice in all the countries, again, we're talking about worldwide trends here, that uh, we have crazy state spending. And the, another important thing that despite all globalization efforts, all those um, uh, particular country efforts, particular blocks efforts are not synchronized. Uh, we have record high fiscal programs of support, we have a record quantity easing, both in US and European Union. Uh, therefore, um, the thing uh, you, Natalia, mentioned before we started about inflation. Inflation is not only about the amount of money. Inflation is also about how fast money turns the economy. 
So if people are sitting home and they're receiving money in cash like they do in America, it still doesn't mean the inflation gonna rise uh, because um, the point is, you know, how fast you're gonna spend it and uh, how much it will turn the economy. Uh, so um, one can expect, and again, that's something which Marius mentioned already, that uh, we're gonna see the increase in global uh, protectionism, which we've seen already in the previous years, but that's gonna increase. Um, so in general, um, how to say, going forward speaking, not about particular sectors, but about the direction where we should uh, look into, more of a local story. So the global corporations, uh, if they want to stay competitive, they would have to make uh, in-house production each of the key countries of their distribution. Uh, it's going to be increasingly more difficult to um, find stories by yourself, um, which would, uh, um, how to say, which would be so obvious like it was before. Another important thing to mention is that um, uh, until, up until now, the difference between conservative and aggressive strategies was pretty tiny. So the person taking additional risk would add two, three percent uh, historically uh, to, their, uh, to their portfolio. Now the importance of the portfolio management uh, gonna rise significantly. In average, this conservative uh, and aggressive strategy uh, gonna be more than 10%. Therefore, uh, you know, the standard approach, let's just buy some fixed income in my conservative portfolio, will not work. So we're going to have an era now of low rates or even negative rates. Therefore, the, the mastership of building the portfolio, of looking after the market, of uh, seeing the trends becoming uh, more and more important. Uh, I would want to share just one picture, actually. There is no need for the whole presentation. Um, just to show you current growth, what we've seen now in the last two months, what it's driven by. Uh, that's basically um, two graphs, very simple. The um, accumulated graph of stocks performance and uh, the uh, accumulated World Central Bank balance sheet. As you see, from the after the middle of March, when we see the biggest crash, the whole growth was driven by the central bank uh, programs, quantitative easing, uh, fiscal policies, and spending. Uh, therefore, again, uh, going forward, uh, we can forget about the inflation, the huge amount of world debt, the quality of fixed income. Uh, will split to two big groups. It will be very conservative instruments with very low yield and all the rest. And the spread between those two will be much more than what we've seen before. Uh, so speaking about the recovery, uh, okay. in the graph I've, I, I just showed you, uh, some can see the B-shaped recovery, but we should understand what it was driven by. And second, that the right leg of V is kind of shorter than the left one. So it definitely will take time. Uh, when we talk about the possible winners sector-wise, irrespective of the geographic location, uh, I've been on top of what Marius mentioned already because it's interesting things. Uh, I also want to mention that not only retail, but any uh, staples retail and uh, household chemicals retail uh, will be on the rise because you know people behavior-wise. Uh, are in stress, they will remember the stress for a long time, and most probably that's gonna drive their consumer uh, behavior going forward. Uh, as odd as it sounds, because we're gonna see a lot of um, uh, normal loans, as uh, Marius um, I just want to should... remind you about time, seven minutes past, we need to summarize the things, and yeah, maybe sorry. the rest of the things to be told over the panel discussion. Yeah, sure. So basically, um, debt collection, as odd as it sounds, insurance companies, uh, I can explain more in panel session why I believe it's going to be an interest in debt. Uh, food tech technologies, cyber support, uh, utilities, uh, and um, computer technologies in a in more wider range, which I, I will write more in the panel session when we're going to discuss about that. In the particular yes, and I kindly ask you to mention about dark horses because these dark horses were uh, interesting subject for all other uh, our friends and panelists when they read uh, the description they were asking me what is this and can they also mention it? Uh, what did you mean about the dark horses? 
Well, dark horse by definition uh, is uh, basically the the horse which nobody believes on, uh, but wants to win the race. Uh, so essentially, uh, when we're talking about the possible winning sectors, certain things is on the on the surface, right? I mean, IT stuff, telecoms, utilities, gold maybe. Uh, so it's going to be crowded trades by definition. So the dark horse is something which may not be so obvious at the beginning. Uh, but, you know, uh, if you're the one who's going to make a bet first on it, you're going to win. <laughs> That's great. All right. Thank you very much, Niji, for your intervention. Uh, and I would like um, us to continue our conversation. And now um, I kindly ask uh, Mr. Andreas Asinodoro, who is the CEO of ATG Funds, founding member and board member, uh, uh, board member and chairman of the Fund Administration Services Committee in Cyprus Investment Fund Association. And uh, we will continue, we will speak about shaping new reality. So uh, Andres, uh, I will unmute you now. Can you, yes? Can you unmute yourself as well? Yes. Great, thank you. Good morning, Natalia. Good morning to all the panelists and all the participants. Um, actually, when you invited me to participate, I was very much drawn to the idea of black horses because it, uh, it, it gives me the opportunity to look at the positive side of all these crises. Uh, because, I mean, the picture, if you look at it in terms of numbers, it's pretty gloomy. But when uh, I look at the COVID as an opportunity, I see a new shaping reality. Uh, and because we are in the middle of this new shaping reality with a destination unknown, it creates a lot of uncertainty at all levels, investors, governments, banks. So I want to analyze this so that we see if there is something positive that can come out of it and what we can do in terms of uh, supporting our, our investors. The first thing that I've, I want to say is that COVID is creating a paradigm shift. What we consider safe is no longer safe. Think about an airport. An airport used to be the safest place before, Today, the airport is definitely not a safe place or somebody's going to think about it twice. That means that a lot of the opportunities are definitely going to live outside our comfort zone or what we are used to. COVID is also bringing us uh, or reminding us of certain truths. The first one is that we are all interconnected. So whatever problems we are facing, we should try and find the solutions, not in the isolation of a single country or a single group, but we should see the interconnectedness uh, across countries and economies. And the other one is that as humans, we cannot escape the grip of nature. So nature is definitely something that should be taken into consideration with, with all these uh, investment opportunities that may be coming on. My Reading in the last few days um, actually brought me across a number of studies and uh, scientists and academics are talking about eight major trends. And uh, these eight major trends are creating dynamics for clear winners and clear losers. Actually, these trends support very much what Mario said um, in terms of winners and losers and what Dimitri mentioned, but I would briefly go through them. COVID has changed the way that we work. So remote working versus office working, clear winners are um, you know, collaboration tools on the internet as opposed to share workspace, physical workspace, which is a clear loser. COVID is changing the way that we shop. COVID is changing the way that we watch things. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting to see the increase in Netflix and online viewing as opposed to people going out to theater, cinemas, and, uh, and even you know, cultural things like ballet. COVID is changing the way that we share things. So there is a tremendous need for big data, higher speeds, and cybersecurity. It changes the way that we perceive travel. So even the way that we will plan our holidays, or even the, you know, the quality of how we want to spend our one or two weeks abroad. It changes the way that we focus on healing. So there is a tremendous shift towards uh, online medical services, medical records online, 
uh, even technology tracking contacts of people to ensure that we're safe. It changes the way that we focus on learning. So we see today that uh, the, the losers are the institutions that cannot support technology and the clear winners are not the ones that can only support technology, but they give the students the option to pick and choose the sub subjects that they, they want to, to learn. And then it changes the way that we trade protectionism on the one hand, but at the same time, strategic procurement, you know, the need for safety, for food security, water security and medical supply security has become critical. If I put all these trends on the table, there is an interesting picture that is emerging, which is that the consumer and the social change is actually coming much faster than any form of economic recovery. So it's not the economic recovery that is fueling all this, but it's the consumer and the social needs that is driving the, the recovery. And this is quite an interesting uh, uh, parameter to, to take into account when trying to identify investment opportunities. The trend is digital. So COVID is not going to hold the fourth industrial revolution. As a matter of fact, COVID is, is actually bringing it uh, closer much faster. But um, the concept of interconnectedness is actually opening up the idea of impact investments. You know, I, I'm old enough to remember the times when people used to smoke on aeroplanes. And we were under the illusion that if you're sitting on the right row, you will be safe from the smoke of somebody sitting on the wrong row. Uh, try, try and apply that in, in flying on a plane with somebody that may be a COVID carrier. So a lot of people, especially institutional investors, have been avoiding or not looking very seriously at impact investments that have a bigger impact on social communities, healthcare, caring for the older, but also the environment. This, I believe, is something that is going to change. We are beginning to see a lot of investors actually looking at impact investment in turning uh, the oceans blue again and converting plastic into uh, energy and clearing up the environment, which is definitely going to present a lot of opportunities. Um, I, I want to qualify my, my, my um, ideas and my... To summarize, yes, to summarize the speech and then the rest which you wanted to say but you didn't, we will move it to the panel discussion. Um, in, in summary, I believe that uh, by looking at the trends and by looking at uh, the dynamics of the, of the new industry, we can methodically identify which are the smart businesses, who are the investors and who are the innovators that can actually drive this investment forwards. And this is where we should search for our black horses for our clients. And definitely Cyprus has a lot to benefit from that by acting as a bridge for this kind of, of structuring of investments. Thank you very much. Thank you for this and positive side at the end of Cyprus is and so. All right, we will move to the next uh, speech and I would like to invite to this virtual floor uh, Mr. George Apios, who is uh, the Deputy Managing Director, member of the Executive Committee of Astrobank and uh, we will speak the title of his speech is making sure that there is a garden will blossom again and the sun returns so uh mr rapius we would like to see and to hear some positive things about sun <laughs> returning so uh we need to switch on the microphone for you uh let me try it unmute should work uh and yes and now the floor is yours uh thank you natalia for the uh, opportunity as you know, I'm, I'm not directly uh, dealing with private banking clients or fund management uh, and investment strategies. My expertise is mostly on general co commercial banking. Uh, but when one talks about investment strategies, uh, it is very important to consider the blend between equity investment and debt. Uh, the higher the debt, the higher the IRR of the investment and uh, the debt element is the part that I understand very well and uh, where I will focus on today. Uh, among other things, uh, investment strategies will need to consider debt financing and who provides the debt. Uh, in the majority of the cases, it's uh, banks. Um, the implementation of uh, the strategy will definitely 
uh, need the, an environment where there is definitely government commitment and, and a robust banking system. So at this point of time, these two elements uh, are seriously tested because they are the ones that control the money supply uh, and they keep the liquidity flowing. Uh, and I think the uh, expansion of the money supply is the way to manage this crisis. And obviously, this is what is being implemented so far as the solution. Uh, I know the Dimitri's uh, comments about the increase in the global debt and uh, how this will eventually affect the sustainability of the growth and how the velocity of money uh, will also affect the inflation. But I say, let's expand the money supply, get the momentum going, and we will fix anything, anything else later because now the patient needs a jump start, and that's what we should, what we should do. Uh, but let me clarify that there is two things, uh, and not just one, uh, when we talk about the, the money supply and liquidity. Um, I remember a Greek banker during the Greek financial crisis uh, who was asked by a journalist, why, do you, why don't you open the tap so that liquidity flows in the economy, they asked him. And he replied, my friend, the tap is wide open. It's just that the water has run out. So there's two elements. The tap must be open and there must be water in the reservoir. So let's see what um, is being done by banks and governments to keep money flowing. Uh, the objective is twofold, to help the existing enterprises with their working capital needs and cover the losses that were created because of the event, uh, and also assist the investors to leverage their capital and achieve their strategies so that they can invest money in the economy, the real economy. The tool here is money supply expansion. Some governments, like the US, the USA, took the road of printing more money and supporting the economic activity by financing the losses caused by the COVID, mainly through grants. As a result, the US money supply went up by 17% in just the five months since the beginning of the year. And just to put this into context, the last five years, the average annual money supply expansion in the US was 5 to 6%. It is clear that the US is going out with a bazooka and that there will be no shortage of liquidity in the US in the post-COVID era, not just for covering losses, but also for new investments. Now, looking at Europe that is closer to home, the EU has taken a different approach from the US. The EU money supply has used, uh, was used to, uh, which used to increase by four to 5% uh, before the crisis, has increased by seven to 8% since the beginning of this year. So not the spectacular 17%, but definitely a noticeable increase in the money supply in the EU uh, member states. So the EU commission last week has made a historic announcement a 500 billion recovery fund available to member state governments. We have not seen this kind of solidarity since the birth of the European Union. The EU government commitment is therefore evident. To add to this, a number of relaxations were also provided by the EU Commission to member states, allowing them to increase their borrowing and temporarily provide state aid towards various segments in various ways like the government guarantee schemes, subsidy schemes, and, and the like. And all member state, states have taken the opportunity and have or are in the process of uh, introducing various government schemes to support the recovery. I'm focusing on the global uh, issue and, and not just Cyprus. Uh, the ECB, the European Central Bank, has complemented this uh, expansion of the money supply by providing ample quantitative easing and liquidity to state member government bonds. In parallel, the EU is looking at its strong banking system to aid the recovery. And this is different from uh, the US and other countries. I think this is wise, a wiser approach because the total debt that will be increased, as Dimitris mentioned, will eventually be shared between the public and the private sector. So there may be a balance there, but not in all countries. I, I'm focusing in the European Union. In a perverse way, for once, we have to be thankful to regulators because they had the foresight after the last financial crisis of 2008 
to introduce the single supervisory mechanism with the objective to make the European banking system fit and strong. The result of introduced measures was not just a complex uh, and common rule book, but also the supervisor pushing all the EU banks for higher capital ratios uh, by introducing buffers. This led to increases in capital ratios in the European banks by about 30% in the last five years. We're talking now about ratios of 16 to 18%. And this robustness, robustness means that the European banks can now absorb the shocks of the crisis and assist the recovery for the crisis. So what did the European Bank do, the European Central Bank? They announced on the 12th of March that they have relaxed the capital buffers for the European banks and some other prudential liquidity requirements. And this means that the European banks are now able to lend about 1.3 trillion euros to customers that need the liquidity. The ECB announcement did not just refer to working capital needs and covering losses. It also referred to investments in the real economy because that's the way out of the crisis. The move ensures that the European banks will be allowed to operate below their required capital adequacy ratios so that they can use the liquidity to fund and fuel the recovery. So in conclusion, in 2018, we went into a global financial crisis because of the weaknesses of our banks and oversights by our, our regulators. We will come out of the 2020 global financial crisis because of our strong banks and our diligent regulators. The response from the member state governments and the European Central Bank was quick. And in my opinion, if the pandemic control results continue in the same trends, it will also prove sufficient to push the Europe European economy out of the crisis. The investment strategies that you will be pursuing will eventually be complemented by the debt funding required. And I am confident that the dark horses of Dimitris and their breeders will find the financing support that they need to surprise the market and win the race. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, George, for this intervention. And um, now I would like uh, to have our last speech, which will, in a way, uh, give us uh, more information because uh, I'm looking now for the presentation that will focus on examining some of the issues which are likely to shape global economic development and impact investment decisions. Uh, in the foreseeable future. So uh, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Omeros Pisaridis, the Managing Director of PwC Investment Services, Cyprus Limited, and the member of the Board of Directors of PwC Fund uh, Investment, uh, Fund Services Limited. So uh, Mr. Pisaridis, the floor is yours. Thank you, Natalia, and thank you also to everybody who's watching us. Well, they say that you should not come between a person and their lunch. So I am the last speaker and we are approaching lunch time. So I will try to keep it short. So what I wanted to talk to you about today relates to a number of issues which are likely to shape the economic developments and therefore impact the investment decisions in the foreseeable future. The truth of the matter is that COVID-19 has exacerbated some of these issues, but in reality, most of them have pre-existed and they will continue to be with us for a long time. So the first issue that I want to focus on is that of economic growth or better lack of it. COVID-19, no doubt, everybody knows that it has had a very significant negative and also an even impact on a worldwide scale. But we tend to forget that the global scene was characterized by slowing growth already in almost all of the major economies. So the response of most countries, including the Eurozone and the United States, was the pursuance of expansionary monetary policies manifested in practice by low or even negative interest rates and the provision of low cost and ample liquidity. What was the result of that? Well, we saw compression of bond yields, even for jurisdictions, corporations considered as high risk. We saw extraordinary increases in the prices of listed stocks, the possibility of bubbles in real estate and challenging times for the profitability of banks. Now, don't get me wrong, we needed an expansionary monetary policy before and certainly during the COVID-19 crisis. And such a policy has many positive effects, including repayment of government and sovereign bonds, 
uh, as well as the refinancing of debt at affordable levels. Overall, however, attention must be paid to its negative side effects, especially the distortion of prices and their misalignment with fundamentals, which are key considerations for investment decisions. So far from being dogmatic, what, am I, what I am saying is that we must also remember that monetary policy has its limits, notably in keeping inflation in check from a medium and long-term perspective. The second point I want to mention, I think it was touched upon before, relates to rising global debt. Now, a number of economists have been warning us that we are drowning in debt. Now, putting cries of pessimism aside, it may be difficult to disagree with that. When the world's total debt rose to $250 trillion and the global debt to GDP ratio is slightly more than 320% in 2019. Again, however, we must be realistic. During the COVID-19 period, borrowing was very much what is called a necessary evil. Many countries, including our native Cyprus, successfully issued sovereign bonds and rightfully so. Nevertheless, the mountain of debt will not go away after COVID-19 leaves us, and one would hope that the governments would turn a deaf ear to populist demands and inject the amounts borrowed in sectors that will improve long-term efficiency and facilitate the repayment of debt. Sectors such as sustainable tourism, health infrastructure, distance learning, digitalization, and renewable, form, and renewable forms of energy. If not, we may be poised for further uncertainty. The third point I would like to bring up relates to political leadership. It's always considered important within the scope of any investment decision, and the nature of the COVID-19 as a truly global disease has, has yielded a few noteworthy lessons. Firstly, if we look at the successful management of the crisis in countries like New Zealand, South Korea, Taiwan, Germany, Iceland, and there I say Greece and Cyprus as well, a country's response during intense crises should be simultaneously timely and ambivalent in order to have a strong sing signaling effect on all economic agents. Secondly, the reality of the matter is that even economically advanced nations depend to an increasingly greater degree on supranational support, which is crucial in a globalized arena. In fact, one of the key messages that the pandemic has delivered is the credibility that, that accompanies a coordinated fiscal response. Finally manifested within the European Union through the recent German-French 500 billion euros agreement, as has been mentioned before by Mr. Appius. Clearly, no country can go at it alone, even if it's the biggest economy in the world. Thirdly, a long-term relationship of trust between those in power and the citizens leads to more rational economic behavior and swifter response to unexpected shocks. In short, behavior of those who take strategic decisions is an important determinant for all those who take decisions at a micro level. Countries whose leadership understands this are likely to attract more investments. And if anybody has any doubts, I refer to the recent words of Yuval Noah Harari when he said that I would rather live in Greece than USA during the COVID-19 pandemic. So where does the above leave potential investors and where do the opportunities lie? Well, for sure, we are increasingly headed for interesting times. More and more funds need to be deployed in a world which is becoming even more interlinked and where the cost of doing business is constantly expanding due to increasing compliance, capital adequacy, and overall regulatory burden. What brews to the surface quite clearly for me is that the importance of fundamentals and the need to proactively and diligently assess every single investment is crucial. Granted, several sectors are poised for growth and that COVID-19 will provide a significant boost to the adoption of improved technological infrastructure, which will affect the sectors of health and social care, education, education, tourism and leisure, the way in which we interact with the state and many more. Judging, however, from previous points in history when opportunities seem to be abound, investors should ultimately be aware that there are no easy choices, no obvious horses to pick. In closing, I'm certain we have all heard that, the country, that in the country where the COVID-19 emerged, the word crisis also means opportunity. I would like to leave you with the full Chinese proverb, which I think is very topical amidst the COVID-19 realities. The proverb goes like this, a crisis is an opportunity, but it is riding a dangerous wind. Let's keep this in mind for the day after and the way forward. Thank you for your attention. I hope this has been useful.
<laughs> Thank you very much. Now I will switch on the gallery view and I advise to all our participants and attendees to do this. So we, we see all of us at once. And uh, also we need to unmute uh, Mr. Pisarius, Mr. Asnadoro, Mr. Golosov, Mr. Apios and Mr. Dimitriadis. So unmute yourself because now it's a time which is really precious. Now it's a time to discuss. And I would like um, to ask, uh, do you have anything to comment to the speeches or information you heard from other panelists? Anyone want to comment our speeches so far? Well, if, if I can start, uh, basically not just to continue, just to mention certain things about horses and everything. Um, the, the success of an investment in the long term is not about finding the investment ideas. Um, the success of the investment is um, systematic risk management, which is done on the distance through diversification and at the moment in sizing. Uh, that's what I was mentioning before, saying that um, now it's even more demanding times with regards to, to the quality of the portfolio build and to the uh, quality of the expertise being used. Um, because again, um, on the long term, the portfolios are successful not because you managed to buy first something which you know grew 50% next month. The quality on the uh, long run is uh, your resistance to the market drops and your ability to uh, to go through you know uh, through the through the fall in certain sectors and certain names. So basically, it doesn't mean that, you know, in such a volatile time, you have to sit on top of terminal and read all the news or make crazy investment ideas. It's about the discipline and it's about the, uh, understanding the basics and better advanced uh, principles of the portfolio theory and how the markets operate. Um, just to kick off the discussion about the things we didn't manage to cover in our discussion before, uh, I wanted to say that there's certain things which um, may look, uh, you know, ridiculous at the first point, uh, but they indeed going to have a lot of business in the coming years. For example, with a tech deal, uh, which, you know, everybody's aware of, uh, the sector uh, which will benefit the most is obviously not all companies, it's not the service companies, but rather than a uh, sector of the companies who are dealing with the commissioning of all deposits because a lot of oil deposits have to be closed due to the lack of use. And within next two years, that's going to be really, really big business. Therefore, um, uh, one may expect that anything in oil industry is not going to be uh, in good shape, but there are certain interesting ideas even there. Uh, the same goes for uh, financial sector. So we all read about NPLs. The debt collectors will be able to buy big chunks of debt with a huge discount and may benefit from the federal recovery. So that's but that. NPLs, um, that was again. NPLs for a few years. Everyone is talking about this, and uh, George uh, can confirm that the, the companies are buying. But something which you mentioned now about oil, so uh, that the companies that are closing these reservoirs will benefit. That's unusual. Andreas, Marius, George, Omeros, can you also contribute something, some industries or some um, fields of activities that are not on the surface, as Mitri correctly said? We, we don't see them at once, but uh, we can guess that maybe during these years they will benefit. Well, if I, if I can uh, mention something that um, came across my desk in the last few days, and I consider that it has a huge impact and it could possibly be adopted in Cyprus. Um, one of the big impacts of COVID is that there is no visitors to museums, there is no um, real uh, income to people visiting all these masterpieces and, and art galleries. And at the same time, we have blockchain technology evolving on the other hand. So a, a group of innovators and group of technology guys came up with the idea of actually doing virtual tours of museums uh, of their artwork, but also beyond that, creating digital image rights of all this that would generate a completely new stream of income to museums for the use of these art in a way that is patented for them. So it's not a matter of taking a piece of art and copying it, but it's a matter that the museum can actually have income from every single time that this image is used across the whole world. 
And now, that's great income because it's the rights of digital use. It means people will use them not hundreds of times, hundreds of thousand times. And even a small fee uh, will be a big difference for such museums, correct? Yeah, of course. And then the digital experience is not just about looking at pictures. You can add the whole narrative about the history of every piece of artifact or even entering into a virtual room and watching history in the making of every piece of art that you're looking at. So technology is offering some opportunities that are not clearly visible at the moment. And uh, it only takes one or two, let's say, uh, museums to invest little money by comparison to how much they're losing uh, to create a whole new industry um, th that will attract a lot, a lot of investment. Mm -hmm. All right, do you want to uh, add anything before I switch on into questions? We have 10 questions waiting in our question and answer uh, tab. Uh, George, Mario, it's on your Well, one thing that I would add is that, you know, COVID-19 has just accelerated some, uh, you know, developments which were bound to happen anyway. So we may be witnessing some changes right now. Uh, but ultimately, we are still talking about, you know, similar services and products that we had before. So, you know, visiting a museum like what Andreas uh, very uh, correctly mentioned now, it, it used to be uh, a real uh, life experience. Now it can be a digital experience. Similarly, uh, e-learning uh, will become a thing of the future. I don't imagine, for example, that my grandchildren will have to go to university and physically be there and so on and so forth. So I think one of the biggest opportunities, one of the biggest industries that will stand to benefit from the changes that are taking place right now is the information technology industry. We'll need many more processors, we'll need many more servers, we'll need um, uh, the, the ability to store all of this data properly. So uh, the IT industry stands to gain very, very significantly from what is happening. And uh, you know the rest of the of the sectors may continue to do business with a different model, but ultimately, uh, you know, it, it may just be serving it in a different way. The IT industry, I think, stands to gain significantly, and obviously, the benefits will filter down uh, through through all of us. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So uh, I will move then if you allow me to the questions because we even have answered questions not only open let me start with open question uh, and um, some people sent us for this excellent uh, initiative uh, and um, okay uh, so temporary but you can also read the questions and i would like to uh, provide guaranteed incentive to impact funds uh, yeah we had a few questions on investment funds that maybe uh, to andreas to omeros to everyone the questions are uh, okay, let me find the. Okay, what is the view of our panel re, uh, relating the impact of COVID 19 on the Cyprus investment fund industry? What steps is Cyprus taking in developing the industry further? And we have also another question on the same uh, topic. Um, so, uh, what is the impact on investment funds? Maybe, Andres, we'll start with you and then anyone else can contribute. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to mention that also Marius is a specialist of the fund sector and one of the founding members of the Cyprus Investment Funds Association. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm glad that he's also on board in this discussion. I have always viewed the funds as a, as a bridging tool between investors and investment opportunities. And uh, one of the, the problems with funds is the timing between the idea of setting up a fund and actually making it work. If we can minimize this time, so from the time that somebody, a fund promoter comes up with the idea of setting up a fund, uh, minimize the time until this fund is ready to be presented to investors, then this is going to put Cyprus clearly in a very advantageous position to some of its competitors. Um, things are moving very fast in the post-COVID period, so the time is of critical essence. The opportunities will not stand here for too long. The second thing is that the funds present a very good opportunity to institutionalize some of the alternative investments. Uh, private equity that used to be done between family and friends or the, behind uh, you know, small corporate finance firms now can be readily available to institutional investors and be formally presented like a, a proper 
uh, investment opportunity with KPIs and investment criteria. Cyprus is definitely one of the options in the alternative investment funds industry. There is still work to be done, but definitely an opportunity to, to, to invite a number of these investments to be structured by Cyprus. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Marius. Okay, um, even though I wanted to make a comment not about funds but about something else, generally speaking, I do believe that uh, the fund industry is, a, is an industry which offers opportunity for Cyprus. Uh, I think Andreas put it very correctly about uh, increasing the ability of the Cyprus regulatory infrastructure in a way, uh, regulatory infrastructure to accommodate this because you have all these people who are trying to promote the sector. Obviously, if it takes a long time to approve a fund, it is a disadvantage, so we need to have some advantages over other countries. So imagine if uh, we had the capacity to approve these funds uh, much faster than other countries, you know, uh, I think it would help all these professionals uh, around there to get the business in a way. Uh, another comment would I wanted to make generally about Cyprus, uh, Natalia, it might sound a bit political, but I will say it. And I saw some of the questions that uh, some of the attenders have put. Imagine, the positive impact we would have in Cyprus if instead of handling, uh, handing checks to people, and I'm talking about the initiative of the government and, and what some of the parties that have been asking the government to hand checks to small business, two, three thousand euros to each of them, if the government invested this money in order to promote the creation of new businesses and promote Cyprus as an innovation and technology, the positive impact it would have and the positive multiplier in the economy. So, uh, you know, if somebody thinks about it from an economist's point of view, I think personally, this is my opinion, uh, it would be the government needs to find ways to diversify the economy. And we have not seen anything yet from the government as a measure to diversify the economy from the traditional side. I do understand that, of course, all these small businesses they need to survive. And the schemes that the government has done so far, they're very good, especially about the payment of salaries. I think those were excellent. But the government needs to come up with ways to benefit from the post-COVID-19 era and not just uh, concentrate on, on basically the existing uh, framework. So we need to see some of those initiatives. All right, thank you very much. Uh, any comments on this subject? Because my next question will be to Mr. Apios. Uh, there is a question about banking system, but anything else on this? Okay, then I will uh, read it. Oh, oh, I could open the whole screen. <laughs> okay, I didn't know this. Let me, okay. Uh, so how does the banking industry see the uh, pullback of the legislation for governmental guarantees uh, to the CY corporate world? Do they believe that this setback um, I lost it, will increase the NPLs from existing loans granted by banks. George? Yeah, uh, the government guarantee scheme that was initiated by the government started, in my opinion, very well because uh, it came out very quickly. I mean, it was like the first week after the lockdown and the government came out with a, a decree and a law uh, but the, then the system, the political system in Cyprus started intervening and putting wedges in the, in the, in the, in the uh, system. And every time you change a paragraph in a, in a law, uh, it may not be in harmony with the rest. And they created a monster eventually that the government uh, itself realized that with all these changes, it will not work. So they pulled it back because obviously the government did not want to take something to parliament that was not going to be voted because if that happens, then it takes another six months after our constitution to um, be able to resubmit. So they pulled it back so that it doesn't get uh, uh, destroyed. So there may still be hope for uh, the government guarantees, but our political system with the government not having majority to do as they think right. And up to now, in, in my point, in my, in my view, and, and I am not uh, uh, preaching for the, for the political party that the government, uh, that supports the government, uh, the government has done all the right steps in all directions, both in the medical scientific side to take us to the results we have now, but also 
for the assistance they have given through the Ministry of Labor to uh, everyone that could not work. Uh, and th these are copies from other countries, but doesn't hurt copying so long as you do it correctly. And they also tried to copy the government guarantee scheme, but they got stuck because the, the, the parliament wouldn't take it through. I think there are other things that uh, the temporary measures announced by the um, European Commission uh, allow the government to do in order to aid and provide government uh, assistance to the economy that otherwise they wouldn't be able to. And I think they will start looking at those tools and we will have soon something coming out. And also they may be able to pull something from this, uh, from the European Union directly from, from this fund so that they don't have to go to the political system that may block things for their own reasons uh, and, and get it through in the economy because that is the intention. I think the government have, has seen the point of these measures. The political system has missed the point completely, completely missed the point. Uh, this is not the time for controls and extra controls and everything. Yes, we may have 100 cases and 10 of them may not be what they should be, but the important thing is to push the economy and get the momentum so that we don't get stuck in this, where is the money, where is the money? I think the central bank and the ECB uh, have given enough um, tools to the banks to be able to support the economy themselves. So this is what the banks are doing now with uh, some relaxations that we had from the Central Bank of Cyprus, there are easier processes that we can uh, proceed and, and give money to the real economy. The pricing may be fit to the risk we are taking, and it, not, it may not be to the level that was envisaged by the politicians. But then again, the banks are private institutions and they need to price to risk. Thank you, George. You know, when the conversation is interesting, the time flies. Now it's already one o'clock and two minutes, and we need to summarize these things. So what I can promise to our attendees, we have many questions, and I, uh, I told to my colleagues now that they copy all these questions. We will send them to our panelists, and whoever wants to reply the questions, they will reply. I take responsibility to summarize everything, and then in a couple of days, by the end of this week, uh, dear participants, dear attendees, you will get a Word, Word file or PDF file from us with answers to the questions. Now, uh, I would like to suggest to our panelists to summarize today's event, but before they do so, I would like to announce the following. Uh, we have, we want to try an unusual format now. You know that in the format of webinar, like now, uh, we cannot see the attendees, we cannot talk to them, and what we would like to have is a coffee break. So when this event will be finished in one, two, three minutes after the summary, uh, what you will need to do now, you see in our chat, uh, my colleagues shared with you the link. So you copy this link, you paste it, you go out of the seminar, webinar, we finish, and you go to drink coffee somewhere else. It will be a link uh, for a coffee break. And I, I, I think that out of um, our 100 uh, attendees who were with us, about 30 <coughs> people will come and share their views as well. All right, before coffee break, to summarize, uh, let's summarize in the same order we had speeches. So, uh, starting with Marius, uh, what was important from what you heard today and what you want our attendees to when they finish this event, when they just close their computer, to stay with them? I think in general, uh, what we need to understand that this kind of crisis, they have opportunities as well. And there are winners, and not only losers. Okay, obviously Cyprus, if I take Cyprus, uh, Cyprus has taken all the right steps in the uh, medical sector, I would say, and is trying to support the economy with measures that all the European Union countries are taking. What we really need to do now is to continue to be serious, and I totally agree with George Arpio's comments, by the way, and we need to focus on how we can exploit the opportunities and the new uh, things that are coming up from this crisis, because there has been uh, a technology leap, and this technology leap will uh, provide opportunities to the countries and businesses that uh, manage to exploit this. So I think that, that should be the central message. Thank you, Marius. Mitri? Uh, well, just in contrast, not to be so positive, 
speaking about other, uh, no, 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 not in a way about the recovery or anything like that, about since, you know, my speciality is anyways, investment advice, investment ideas, about uh, something to think. The, the rise of the global protectionism as opposed to the globalism and all the monetary measures we've mentioned during our speeches and panel discussions uh, obviously will rise to tensions. Uh, and tensions, you know, usually uh, resolved in not the most peaceful ways. So again, uh, as odd as it sounds, as bad as it sounds, uh, and you know, I feel like a, a doom, doom a preacher today with all the debt uh, collection and everything like this, Defense sector is again something which may benefit in a growing uncertainty, uh, and that again may uh, may be an opportunity to consider. Speaking about the recovery and everything, I personally advise because you know I, I'm looking at a lot of markets on Cyprus only. Uh, Cyprus had very good I, IP box program, and uh, the way forward would be to to work in this direction. Uh, stop paying so much attention to real estate and uh, speak more. Attract the community. It's already very big. The biggest Russian speaking IT community abroad is in Cyprus. Uh, but there is still some room to improve, and that's going to give a push to the whole economy. That's, mm -hmm. that's my perception. Thank you. Thank you, Dmitry. Andreas? Um, a lot of changes are on the table. Some of them are like elastic band. We're going to roll back in the old ways, but most of the changes that COVID brought forward are, um, in, there is no going back. This presents us with a lot of opportunities and the opportunities are here for our companies, for Cyprus as a country, but also for the investors um, watching us. I believe that uh, speed and responsiveness to these opportunities is critical. So if I may borrow from an Arabic proverb that I came across the last few days, uh, where they actually fish for pearls, they say, he who, who will enter the water first after a big storm is always a tough question. But this is the time when the pearls of opportunity are the most plentiful. So I believe that uh, this is the time when we can actually systematically go for the opportunities at all levels, company, uh, country, and investors. And uh, I see COVID-19 as a two-sided coin. Invest 2020 and beyond is the other side of the coin that I like to see. All right. Thank you, George. Um, I'm more, I, I will escape from my, my presentation conclusion and, and say that I'm more traditional in looking at things. If we look at the history of not just uh, the world as we know it, but the planet of Earth, I mean, billions of years, there have been events uh, that changed the world. I don't think this event is of the magnitude of the dinosaurs disappearing, of the first man appearing, of uh, the invention of the wheel. It's, it is an event, but don't forget we had uh, a similar pandemic uh, about a hundred years ago when I think two million people died in Europe and then the world just restarted and nothing will change the habits of human beings which are social species and the technology and the museums walking in in rooms will not be able to replace the physical presence of standing in front of a painting with your children uh, looking at the painting, nothing will replace that. Uh, my wife is a teacher. She had uh, been teaching over the internet with teams uh, for the past uh, two months. They went back to school. She came back the first week. She said, nothing will ever replace the physical teaching in the classroom, nothing. And, and that is the, the conclusion of just the teaching profession. And I think similar things we will find in other professions. And, we will not be able to work for home across. Deals on M&As will not be concluded if people do not meet and chat and flirt each other. Sure, thank you. Omiris. Yeah, I mean, like, like every you know, event of this, of this magnitude, uh, there's many lessons to, to take home. And I think the lessons are not you know, that dissimilar between countries. Obviously, every country um, responded differently. If we were to focus on Cyprus, I think uh, we have done 
a, a good job uh, and I think we stand to gain out of this and this may answer some of the questions in relation to the funds opportunity for Cyprus. I think Cyprus will gain out of this. At the same time, uh, as we see uh, in Cyprus and in other countries, uh, what Andreas uh, said before, the time to respond uh, is very uh, crucial and the way and the magnitude of the response. So one would expect that we have come out wiser uh, out of this, uh, otherwise uh, we may uh, do the same mistakes in the, in the future. Um, and as it relates to the sectors to, to invest, uh, at the end of the day, this is uh, an investment forum. I would say that nothing replaces, uh, you know, the due diligence and the proactiveness with which uh, every investment should be approached, if anything. It's even more important uh, to be aware of these fundamental principles in a world that is becoming more and more united and where shocks uh, can affect uh, every country and every company quite quickly. Thank you. All right. I would like to thank all of you for your contribution to today's conversation. It was very interesting and all our attendees for being with us. Now, what we need to do, all of us, me included, uh, we need to copy the link which you see in the webinar chat so I will be here until everyone copies this link, copy it, not to be lost. And then we will close this chat and we will go for coffee break uh, to another chat when uh, we can talk with everyone freely. All right, so everyone has copied uh, and we are moving. Thank you very much for today's conversation. Bye-bye. All the best. Have a nice day. Thank you. Okay, so I will end the conversation.